Thanks for joining us again for an episode of Your Brain on Hops. This time we are coming for, to you from Big Dish in Buffalo, New York. And uh, we're here for a special event as well. I'm joined by, you guys can introduce yourselves. Hi, I'm Alex. Hi, I'm Tim. We're also here with Matt from Big Dish. Hello. Hi, Matt. Thanks so much for having us here and talking to us about the brewery, about the beer, about the event. Uh, so just to kick things off, if you could talk about the uh, the releases that you guys have going on today. Sure. So um, we did a triple can release, actually, which is the most uh, amount of cans we've ever tried to sell out of the brewery before. So um, we did uh, our Hayburner, which is our flagship IPA. It's most of what we actually make at our brewery right now, but we double dry hopped it, which is extra exciting yeah. to people these days. And it came out really good. So double dry hopped Hayburner. And then we um, did a reprise, sort of a uh, you know re-release of Fifth, which is our Lock IPA number two. Um, and then we also usually when we do these, we sort of campaign them also on with Deep Cut, and we do Deep Cut every once a month, which is our uh, award-winning double IPA. So yeah, we got lots of uh, lots of IPAs today, but that's what the that's what the kids seem to want, so uh, oh, yeah. we uh, <laughs> we make them. So and it's gone pretty well. I'm curious with the Hayburner, how come you guys decided to do a DDH version of it? So, um, well, you know, with brewing, there's either like, hey, we let let's let's do this, and we come up with an idea and we try it, or sometimes it's just like, hey, what if we did this? <laughs> uh, the the double dry hopping Hayburner. So double dry hopping is probably you could have a long discussion of that on its own, and I'm happy yeah. to talk about that as much as you'd like to. <laughs> but uh, there have been increasing number of beers that are called double dry hop. So we've been seeing that, and actually, there's no real technical definition of what that means. I can tell you what we've done to our beer, but we're like, let's try that with our beer. So for for us, we added basically twice the amount of dry hops. Um, so a true double dry hop, which is a lot of a lot of hops that went into oh, this beer. Yeah. Um, do you do it in stages or is it all at once? Yep, so normally when we dry hop our beers, we do them all at once. And this, this is sort of, the, to me, the confusing part of this term double dry hopping is, you could take a small dry hop portion and do it twice. Does that make it double dry hopped? Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't really know. And so to me, it's a little bit of a marketing term. Um, you know, you can use that in, in any way, shape, or form, because there's no clear definition. But in this case, we have our flagship hay burner, which is usually dry hopped once. Double dry hopped hay burner was dry hopped once, we pulled off dry hops, and then dry hopped it again. And then the second dry hopped, um, second dry hop, we use slightly different hops. Um, Falconer's Flight goes into all of the dry hopping for normal hay burner. But we added in a little bit of um, Galaxy Mosaic into the second dry hop, because we wanted to just... <laughs> Uh, up it a little bit, you know, and make sure that it came out pretty awesome. And like, we didn't have to use a lot of those, but it did come through. Um, it tends to be a little bit more tropical and a little less citrus than Hayburner usually is. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it is delicious. Yeah. I was just telling the guys this before we met you that it's probably up in my upper tier of beers. It's really great, really drinkable. It's super hoppy, but yet delicious. I, I love it. Great. Yeah, it came out. It's like this is a beer that, like, you know, it's, it's challenging sometimes doing these beers, like scaling them up. We had done this in cask before. So a little, ca like a five gallon cask, we just like just throw drafts in the cask and then go with it, you know? And people seem to really like it, but we had, you know, this is like a 40 barrel batch of it. And like we, you know, you can't just try that and then if it doesn't work, dump it. So, you know, we were nervous about how this came out and we had, you know, you never know how things are gonna go, but this turned out I think probably even better than I expected. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, I think the last time I came for a can release was when you first released FIP in cans, yeah. um, and I came in to pick up some FIP and uh, Deep Cut, yeah. and there was a double dry hopped hay burner yep. in cask. Yep, that correct, day. correct. And that might be the first time we did it actually. Oh well, it was phenomenal that day too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I think it's actually like dry hopping in casks is um, can be variable because. Like the beer is sort of served warm, and the hops. How long are the hops in the cast for? You can't take mm. them out, so you can get them a little vegetal if it lasts too long or a little too green. With that so, with the uh, the lower carbonation in a cask, you're not going to have that big aromatic aroma. quality. 
yep. like hitting you in the face. Yep, for sure. So my, my hope was that it would be even better on large scale. And I, I in my opinion, it is. You know? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah, it's really good. So the second canon lease uh, fit. So that part of the lock series, and that was number two, I believe. Yep. The lock series. So how come you guys decided to re-release one of the lock series beers? And then what made you go with fit as well? So, um, all right, so I'll talk about the four beers we've done as part of that series real quickly. Re a quick review. I didn't know there was four. I thought there, there was only three. Yeah. There was four, right? You might have missed one. Uh, yeah. Uh -oh. Dibble. Yep, that's right. I'll oh, Dibble. I'll tell you about the last one. Okay, yeah. And then I'll tell you why we did that one as opposed to even doing a new one at this point. So we had Packet, which was our number one. And that was like all Galaxy Mosaic, and that was mm. our most popular one, probably. That was really good. <laughs> yeah, that was, was very that was pretty good. popular. And then FIP was, a, um, FIP was the second, which is the one we've got here. So FIP has Citra Mosaic, Simcoe, and Amarillo. It's like nice creamy mouthfeel, like no sweetness, and really not much bitterness either, uh, at least in this batch when it went good. Um, first batch is a little more bitter than the other ones. Um, and then we did the third one was a beer called 363. Um, and 363 used a special yeast. It's like... Uh, Saccharomyces histoire is sort of one of the uh, the names for it. It used to be it was actually originally classified as a Brett strain, and then they found that it was a Saccharomyces strain, so a traditional brewer's yeast, but it acts really weird. That one's challenging. You need to ferment it warm. It ferments really slow, and like it doesn't flocculate really well, so it leaves the beer really hazy. And that one was like very challenging and also very expensive because of the special yeast. So that's one that we probably would do like maybe one more time sometime in the future, but I wasn't ready to repeat that. And then Dibble, we just did. So we did Fit because it had been a while since we did it. It was, um, we thought really good. It sold pretty well for us. And it was probably the easiest to execute of all those. We didn't do Packet because um, Galaxy Hops are really hard to come by and they're very expensive. And so we will do Packet again, but it's gonna be like, when we happen to have those hops and when we can sort of make this work, you know, because people ask us about that one all the time. But FIP is really like... That was my next question, actually. FIP is a close, <laughs> yeah, FIP is a close second to pack it. So, you know, this, it's like right before July 4th and we figured we'd do this like triple whammy kind of thing. Mm -hmm. People are going to be you know? partying, fill them up with cans. Yep, yep. Yeah. So, so like, and again, like I wasn't sure it'd go, but like from what I saw, it went about as well or maybe a little better than I expected. We'd, 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 you know, there's a good. big line out there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I thought there might be one. Like, it was mm. got pretty exciting, but it was even you know bigger than I thought. So yeah, it's, yeah. It's People great. were buying lots of it. Like we were noting, like I was, I was happy to get my four because of budgetary reasons, and then looking yep. around, it's like this guy's got three cases, that guy's got two. Like, Holy cow! Yeah, so, yeah. I, uh, you know. Everybody's got a different level of disposable uh, beer uh, beer budget. <laughs> beer budget, you know. Uh, my my personal beer budget probably is not on the level of some of the folks that came here today. But hey, all all the power to them, you know. Yeah. So cool, and I'm happy they were here. So, mm -hmm. so of the four uh, lock series, what's your favorite? Man, okay. Uh, Like I think Fip and Packet are pretty close. So actually, because you know, I've been involved every single one. I sort of think of them in batches. Okay. So like people, um, I think when people try these beers or buy them and whatever, like they don't realize that it's at least for us anyway a progressive learning experience. Okay. So it's very few times that the first time we make something will be exactly like the second. So like again, a lot of people talk about Packet. But for sure, like Fit Batch Two was better than Packet Batch One. Packet Batch One was like super bitter, was, or at least as for me, it was extremely bitter. Packet Batch Two was a lot better than Packet Batch One. So it's probably between like Packet Batch Two and Fit Batch Two between those two, you know. So you dibble and dabble. I see. Oh, I see. <laughs> yes. I and I probably even did, probably <laughs> like dibble Batch One because now we learn how to make these a little bit better. It was probably better even than Packet Batch One, you know. Hmm. So. It's it's sort of on a batch batch basis now. Like this for this example for FIP this time we didn't change anything from the last time we made FIP because we pretty much thought we got it. But that's how it goes. If you brew it on a small scale, you tweak some things. It goes up to large scale. That first batch is never rarely completely dialed in. You got to do it again to dial it in. So if, you know what I always say is you have to take that into account when you're buying a, a new beer from a, a brewery, you know, especially one that's as young as ours, you know, it's mm -hmm. like, you know, the first batch is 
you know, if, if you're like, I really like it, but you know, there's something that's a little off on it. We probably already know that, and we're going to go fix it again. You yeah, know? we're already planning for that for the yeah. next batch. And that's another reason why we never release just one of these things and move on, because we already know that the second one will probably be a little better than the first. You know, mm -hmm. um, so that's usually how it goes. How exciting is it to be part of this emerging beer scene in Buffalo? I mean, I coming from I just moved uh, full disclosure moved from Maryland. Everyone listening knows from the our previous episode. Um, but and coming back here and just seeing that beer culture has just exploded since I, I moved in 2012, mm -hmm. and since then it's been you know you guys and a whole bunch of others just open up and it's awesome. So is that something pretty cool for you guys to be yeah, part of that? Yeah, for yeah. sure. Um, so in in my mind, like it sort of started with uh, like the reinvigoration of this beer scene we have here. Probably started with Community Beer Works. Mm -hmm. I mean, they opened in two thousand and twelve. Right? Yes, mm -hmm. yeah, twelve. Right yeah. when I left, that figures. And, and you know, I, I should have. Yeah, right. You, you left at the wrong time. But, I did. Uh, I did. But that's fine. It's all good. I always came back and tried some. Yeah, that's, that's good. Um, and, and I think like like them opening. They were the first brewery to open in Buffalo. I think since Flying Bison, and which is from mm -hmm. my mind like two thousand and one, maybe. Oh yeah, yeah. It was so it was a I, I think their like campaign and their sort of like them documenting how they opened and being the first brewery to open for a long time. And then as good as the beer was when they first started making beer, like it was very good mm -hmm. right from the beginning. And I think that was the beginning of people saying like, there's a, you know, there's a definite interest in craft beer. You know, there were people who didn't believe, I remember around the time that you could even make good craft beer in Buffalo. There was some, <laughs> you know, which is not true. I don't, no, not, right, at all, not at all. But there was, Example this, there, a. there was like, oh, well, like the water here sucks. So you can't even make good beer here. Mm -hmm. So there was, you know, there's a lot of education that's had to happen to get to this point. But I mm -hmm. mean, they, they started that like inflection point of people saying like, you can make good beer here. Mm -hmm. Just stop um, tapping into Lake Erie and you're fine. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, I don't know that, that people might be thinking that. I don't, you know, I don't know. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so, um, and then it's, yeah, I mean, it's come a long way since then, obviously. So, I mean, when we were planning this, CBW wasn't even open. I didn't even know about them when we were began planning this, you know, but I think there were three breweries in the Buffalo area, not counting Ellicottville and Southern Tier. Mm. And now there's, you know, like 30. Oh, yeah. yeah. So um, it's come a long way. And it seems um, like every year there's another one. Mm -hmm. Every, yeah, well, there's several. Right. Mm -hmm. There's three, it seems like there's three or four every year. Yeah. So, um, but Buffalo is definitely a beer town. It's still like progressing. It helps that our sports teams are staying, you know, well, at a level yeah. that makes us want to enjoy the beverage. Yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> true. So, and like um, the, the, the next level of this thing is people really in my opinion, like believing that Buffalo is capable of making beer on par with anywhere else in the country. Mm -hmm. And one thing, I was just saying this right before we opened today, it was like Buffalo doesn't quite believe in itself yet, mm -hmm. in my opinion. You know, like we don't have confidence <coughs> yet. Um, and Buffalo still doesn't have like that flag, like not flagship, but just that really like that brewery that's known outside of Western New York, you know. Mm -hmm. Right. So um, I'm hoping it doesn't need to be us, but I'm hoping one of us gets there and, and, and you know, brings attention to the quality of Buffalo breweries to, you know, you guys beyond do, just the area. You do distribute outside of Buffalo, don't you? We distribute to Rochester only. Rochester, right. Yeah, that's as far as we go. And that's as far as we're going to go for a while because right. we have no more capacity. Right. So, um, it's got to make sure the hometown is satisfied first. Yeah, yeah. But mm -hmm. I don't even know, like, if that's necessary. I mean, several of these really hot, popular breweries are destinations people go to, you know. I mm -hmm. mean, not to be cliche about this, but so a brewery like Treehouse, okay, which I'm guessing you guys know of, right? Well, absolutely. Is, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> right? So, I don't know the audience. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so, so, I mean, Treehouse doesn't distribute anywhere, right. it's mm -hmm. just all visitation, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, so to make Buffalo a brewing destination is the goal, which I think we're starting to achieve. I was starting to bring stuff from here. Instead of bringing so much stuff from Maryland to here, I was starting to bring stuff back down. That's great. Hey Burner was one that I brought down. Um, I had a growler from Pearl Street that I brought down once. Like, I mean, I, I try to get people interested, but I mean, obviously Niagara Falls is always going to be a draw. So if we can get people to go to the falls, get the yep. wings and drink the beer, yep. that'd yep. be a win, win, win. 
true. It sounds like a great vacation. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. I That's what I keep telling my friends. And like beer tourism is a thing. Oh yeah. Oh it's, yeah. It's definitely a thing. Mm -hmm. You know. So. Um, well, anytime I plan a vacation, one of the first things I look at for the area I'm definitely going to go to is mm -hmm. okay. Well, what breweries are there? Yeah. What can I go and see, and what's popular? Yep. Yeah. Me and my family just went to Cleveland just for a few days. It was close, and I got little kids. So we won't go too far. Yeah. But I, you know, I did drag them to three different breweries. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, and then the, the other thing about breweries these days, like, you can go and you know bring a family. I was surprised mm -hmm. how many kids were here, you know, this morning yeah. even, you know. So I'm very happy to see that it's it's the family oriented sort of thing, you know, not not the drinking so much, but the experience, mm -hmm. you know. Right, right. You can sit down, have a meal, kids stay entertained, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, yeah. You're seeing that more and more too in the breweries that are popping up. Is that everyone mm -hmm. allows kids like, and and it's more of a family oriented thing yeah. instead of a. And I'm wondering, does that really come from the the collaborative effort of breweries with other breweries that we? It's more of a family effort in hmm. in mentality. Yep. I mean, because there is a lot of collaboration within the industry. Yep, that's yeah. true. Um, why the family-oriented feel to breweries? I just think that, uh, like, making beer is a craft and takes some time to do that. I think you'll find a lot of um, brewers and brewery owners probably have families of their own, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so b because of that, they just make it a more family-open experience, you know? Yeah. Um, but I guess I don't really know exactly why that is, but it's nice for me. I mean, we aim to make this a family-oriented. We have a kid's menu, mm -hmm. you know? And like, um, three out of our four owners have kids, you know? Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, it's good that we were able to do that. Coming from someone that has a wife and a two-year-old, I can't help but appreciate it, because it's hard to convince, you know, two-year-olds, as I'm sure you're aware, of quite a, a struggle sometimes. And so to be able to bring them to a place like here, New York Beer Project, or any of the places that have high chairs available, yeah. we can put him in, he's got his mac and cheese or whatever, and he's happy, and I can sample four or five beers, or six or seven, yeah. and just enjoy myself. My wife enjoys good beer too, and it's just, that really adds to our ability to try these breweries out. Yeah. So places like yours, and I, I mentioned New York Beer Project, and a couple others, that it's just fun. Yep. And we brought my brother-in-law and sister-in-law here or to uh, New York Beer Project, and then we're gonna keep going around. Yep, yep, and it's I, awesome. I think it might tie into the tourism piece as well, too, yeah. is, you know, it's a family-oriented thing. Mm -hmm. you know? So it, it's, it, it's nice that it's a little more open. Mm -hmm. The one big question um, I wanted to ask, and I, I had to look it up because I wasn't sure what big questions to ask, is how do you reach beyond the hardcore beer drinkers and into the general public to sell your beer? Right, um, that's a good question. Um, so, so, so the first question is how many hardcore beer drinkers, well, hardcore beer drinkers being like people who would line up for special yes. IPAs right. and cans, right? Mm -hmm. um, so the, the in my opinion, the reality is in Buffalo is there's not many hardcore beer drinkers that will line up. You know, I mean, like there's there's a lot more of them in other areas of the country. Mm -hmm. So this is still like a macro beer drinking uh, city for the most part. Mm -hmm. You know, so um, you know it's much harder to get people, I think, to come out to the to your brewery on a Saturday morning to. You know, spend what's going to be like a hundred bucks for a case of beer, yeah. then to get them to go buy a six pack of something for ten bucks, you know. Mm -hmm. And so that's most of what Buffalo is. So how we appeal to that? I mean, we make a lot of IPAs, and I think we, we skew a little towards the you know your geeky crowd, but we try to make a lot of really approachable beers too. Mm -hmm. um, and when like we see, yep, like yeah. FC is an it's example delicious. of that. It's four percent. Mm -hmm. You know, it's an, officially an IPA, but like mm -hmm. it's super drinkable. You know. Right. Um, and then, you know, we do samplings and tastings all the time, you know, mm -hmm. so we go out to like a Wegmans or a Tops or a Consumers, mm -hmm. um, you know, we're sampling shoppers, not <laughs> hardcore beer drinkers, yeah. but there are people like perusing the beer aisle, like, I don't know what to get, like, try one of these, mm -hmm. you know, and usually we find that's pretty effective, like, they'll find something they want, you know, and that's not always hay burner. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes it's like, it's like, oh, I want something a little more flavorful than macro X and I like your low bridge. It's a little more than that, you know? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I, I think most of our beer sales are not hardcore beer drinkers. They're, uh, they're shoppers, mm -hmm. you know, and they're, they're, they're general beer drinkers and they like craft beer and they like local and they like us. Mm -hmm. 
I think a big thing that maybe you guys might agree with this is when, whenever I'm with someone at a bar, brewery, doesn't matter, and they all say, well, I'm not really into beer. In my head, I hear Barney Simpson saying, challenge accepted. Yeah. Like, I will get you to try one beer you like. I don't care if it's a sour, sour a Berliner Weiss, an IPA, a stout, but I, I look at the menu and go, you're going to try this one and you'll like it. And that's what's kind of cool about breweries is you're never going to find IPA, double IPA, triple IPA. You're you're done. There's always three or four other styles you can get someone to try, or if they if they are that light beer drinker that sticks with their Bush Lights or whatever the macro beers, um, then you could find something they'll drink. A blonde ale is usually a nice start off for yep. someone like that. Yep, I think um, for non beer drinkers, someone you know calls a non beer drinker in their head, they're classifying beer as one of three types of beer. There's uh, blue. There's Guinness, mm -hmm. and then there's IPA, which equals bitter. Yep. <laughs> so <laughs> they're like, better. I don't like beer because I don't like any of those three beers. And mm -hmm. it's like, they don't know that there's a whole world out there and all such a variety of styles. And mm -hmm. beer, I mean, can go any which way. There's infinite number of combinations, you know, which is mm -hmm. one of the reasons I like beer so much more than wine is that you, you get so much potential variety in what you can get, not just from brewery to brewery, but even just interpretations of styles, you know? So, right. so getting those folks into craft beer, that's really where the, the challenge is, you know? Um, and, the, and mostly what we do is what I call public relations, but that's really a lot of sampling, mm -hmm. you know, festivals and stores and, you know, tap takeovers and, you know, and even bringing people here. I mean, we, we, we built this tap room almost as like our factory showroom. <laughs> it's like if you want to come here and experience it the way it's supposed to be experienced, you know, come here and, and try, you know, and I, I think that's done, that's been, um, it's gone, gone good for us. Having a really solid starting lineup, which I think Big Ditch has helps too, and not only a starting lineup, but one that's pretty common, because I, I have friends who aren't really that into beer, but they've seen Big Ditch Porter in a bunch of places, and they know they like porters, so... We go somewhere else where there's a bunch more taps. They might see a porter and try that, and they might see a different big dish brewery and say, "Well, I trust them because that porter that I've had in a bunch of places mm -hmm. is good." So I think I might try this other thing. Yeah. So I think that's definitely important, and I've I've seen it expand people's beer palettes really. Yeah. I mean, we um, put a good amount of thought to our signature beers, which like uh, so we have Lowbridge, our golden ale, and then Excavator, sort of our brown ale, and then um, Hayburners, our IPA. And then, uh, you know, we wanted to do something, you know, something very approachable being the, the golden ale. And then also a dark beer for folks that didn't want something light and that really liked that, you know. So you kind of have like the, right? You kind of have like the the, the lager or the dark, the, the dark beer and then the IPA. Yeah, you run um, the gamut so that people have what they already think about beer and you have those to give them yep. a taste of yours. Yep. Now, originally, I thought that Low Ridge was gonna be the big seller. I was sure that um, like people were just looking for like something, a transitionary period from, <laughs> or a transitionary beer from a lager to a craft beer. Um, but very quickly, it became apparent that um, Buffalo likes IPAs. Oh, yeah. they, they like them a lot, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, so. <clears throat> I think the world loves IPAs. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, it's the style that, so, you know, uh, it's the style that America has mastered. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, so Belgium, Belgium has its styles, UK has its styles, Germany has several styles. <laughs> America's mastered IPAs. You yeah. know, we do them better than anybody. Um, so, America. Yeah, America. right around Fourth of July. How appropriate! Which is also <laughs> just one other interesting point about this. We called Hayburner again. Like there wasn't so much thought. We called Hayburner Hayburner American IPA, and something about that term American IPA like resonated with people because I remember I used to go to shows very early, like tastings, and people would be like, "Give me the American." That's what they used to say. give me the American. Mm -hmm. Like so, so something about that I think probably helped with. That as well too, which was again like I was just trying to distinguish from like a, a English IPA, yeah, you know? yeah right? Mm -hmm. um, so you were thinking stylistically, and they were just they're grasping like, to the American patriotism. Yeah, they're like yeah. America. <laughs> I, want, I want that American yeah. thing, you know. So anyway, it's kind of funny. Hmm. Um, another question that we had was, uh, which was it? Um, if there was a beer that you could brew uh, with no regards to the cost or production or sales, what would it be? <laughs> oh my god so you're like um, 
All right, so, so to the back up a little bit, and then I didn't think about that for like a, just a couple of seconds. It's like, so I don't brew beer anymore. So I, I am very involved with the brewing process. I sort of help to manage the brewers, but I haven't actually brewed beer since it was in my, really in my, well, the first few months of really opening a brewery here, and I was helping Corey, who's our head brewer, you know. Right. Mm-hmm. So I'm always thinking about all of those things when it goes to what beers do we want to make, you know. What the heck would I make if I could make anything? Um, well, we've sort of done this. Okay, let's, let's, well, I mean, I'd love to make a lot more sours, you know, or like Brett in. Mm-hmm. Brett infused beers, so with no regards to anything, I'd probably just ruin our entire brewery and fill it with bacteria <laughs> and wild yeast, you know? <laughs> uh, so it's like, who cares? Let's just do that. And like, I think if I did that, it probably it would be obviously suicide, you know? Um, but like, I love a really dry Brett Saison, you know? Mm. Um, I, I really like mixed fer- fermentation beers. Like, we even, like, we, we have these ideas about really doing on a bigger commercial scale like some nice fruited sours mm-hmm. um like fermenter sour beers with lots of fruit in them that's a big emerging flavor like now right now because a lot of my friends down in maryland were saying that they are really starting to enjoy that and even myself is, i'm coming around to the sour taste like i never thought i would like it but there's a couple coming out in local places like southern tier brewing and others that it's really good yeah yeah for mm-hmm. sure i mean i think we all enjoy sours you know we played around with them I don't know how we would do that. I think some of them would sell well and some might not. Um, I also think it's funny to imagine an all sour brewery in Buffalo. Like, Hmm. how would that do? Would they be successful? Like a a crooked stave here in Buffalo. Yeah. I mean, Hmm. that would be a real challenge, I feel like, for Buffalo to accept and understand, you know, which sort of has a prior price point. So I'm back in my business hat, obviously, you know. But (laughs) But see, uh, I think that's one of the reasons that you answered the question really well is that. Without thought of cost or production or anything like that, you set up a sour house yep. where you only do sours. Yep. And that's where the whole production to get that whole line going yep. starts. Yeah, but I mean, like, that is extremely expensive and time consuming. <laughs> and, like, and I'm not even 100% certain that that would, again, from a sales perspective, do really well here. So, um, but if I had no regards, I think we do a lot of that stuff, you know, and maybe, and you know, our plan is in the future to do more of it, but uh, I don't know how yet. <laughs> <laughs> we already do a kettle sour. Right? Yeah, yeah, we do. Uh, we've done a couple of kettle sours, you know, um, and we've done some barrel aged sours, but like, uh, like those are few and far between. They take mm-hmm. a long time. They, we don't have much space to even hold them, you know, mm-hmm. so. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Kind of where we're at. That uh, cool. that squeezer is phenomenal. I, yeah, every nice. time I see it, I can't help but get some. <laughs> yep, yep. Thanks, man. Thanks. Yeah, that's that's one that our um, our leaper on third shift or overnight shift, Dave O'Connor, came up with. So he he did a Kolsch with Nelson Savan hops, and which is really nice. So you want like the grape sort of wine flavor from the Kolsch to mix with the grapiness of the Nelson. Yeah. And then I was like, this is good, but what if we soured it? And, and he was like, I don't know. So we made them side by side. He's like, no, we're going to stick with the sour, you know. <laughs> and then over time, we changed the hops a little bit and this sort of thing. So, but yeah, it's a, it's a nice beer, super refreshing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I love it during the summer. Yep, yep. Thanks, man. Do you normally go through a few phases of R&D before putting it on the uh, tap list? Yeah, I mean, our typical thing is we'll brew a pilot, see how that goes. Very rarely, even the first pilot is perfect, so we'll maybe pilot it a second time. Usually by that second time we're pretty happy with it, and then we scale it up, and then um, and then again it probably takes at least another revision to, to to get that right. But you know we're also constantly tweaking. So I mean Hayburner, we've now changed the recipe, I believe, or at least the recipe and or process something like over ninety times. Mm-hmm. Like it's just continually evolving and changing, and we're tasting and tweaking. And like again, the thing about beer is that beer is a seasonally derived. Uh, biochemical process Mm -hmm. all natural (laughs) comes out of the ground so it's constantly changing and even our brewers who taste every single batch like they can't the changes are sometimes so minute they can't even pick up the flavor differences so occasionally like it'll move a little bit more this way and we'll have to send it back this way you know but like every hop harvest is different 
you know, yeast every generation behaves a little differently. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's a constant, so it's, it's a process that's never finished. Right. Mm -hmm. And for the actual consumer coming in here, even if they're coming in here for happy hour once a week and constantly drinking Haber from the day you open to right now, they probably have never noticed all the tweaks because they were so small along the way, along those 90 changes. Correct, correct. I mean, very few of them were like huge. And if they, if they were huge, we wouldn't probably let that happen. <laughs> right. You know, we'd make sure they were sort of subtle. Um, so, yeah. The one beer that changed for me for you guys, and I, maybe it's because it was such a long time since I had had it, when you first opened, or whenever the first time you had the FC on, and I tried that, and I remember on our favorite brewery check-in app, I, I didn't give it a very high review, and I was kind of like, it was kind of light for me. And then I just had it the other day um, while watching a World Cup game, and I was blown away, and I said, there's no way this is the same thing. I did. And it wasn't like it was that drastic, but something about the way you did it tweaked, and part of me always gets hit in the face with that. That's why this is art. Yeah. It, kind of, it changes so much that you can just kind of go, that was fine. I didn't not like it. I just tried it again and went, wow, this is actually really good. I could crush a lot of these because it's four something percent, right? Yeah, it's like a 4.1. Yeah, yep. it's, it's really good. I don't we've know what you've changed with tweaked, FC, but... like we've changed the green bill a little bit. Like it used to be 3.5 and then we mm -hmm. started canning it. We, we, we bumped it up a little bit because we thought that people would be just less willing to pay 10 bucks for a six pack, something that was below 4%, you know? <laughs> That's fair. So we bumped it up just a little bit. Um, but not a lot of drastic changes. It's pretty much mm -hmm. always been made with the same hops, pretty much pretty, uh, like half weed, half uh, base malt. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so, you know, I, I think tasting beer is very subjective. And I think sure. even, you know, even people who consume a lot of beer or self-proclaimed beer geeks or even beer judges don't mm -hmm. really even realize how subjective it is. And I know that even firsthand is like, yeah. I'll taste a beer in the morning then I'm like, oh, I'm not sure there's something wrong with this, you know? And then I'll like drink some water and get my head right and, you know, maybe eat something and I'll taste in the afternoon. And I was like, oh, it's way better than I thought it was this morning, you know? <laughs> and like, it, it's honestly makes you crazy sometimes, but mm -hmm. it's truly like, it's very subjective. There's mm -hmm. very little, yeah. you know, there's very little objective about beer. You can measure everything in beer. That's still ain't gonna tell you if it tastes good, right? right. So. Um, right at the same time every style I mean you have your guidelines for what it should be but that's based off of the person's palate are they getting that mm -hmm. yep yep yeah for sure you know for sure and like and then again someone will have a they'll have a beer and then they'll have a one after that that's different and you really can't very objectively judge even the second one after the first one. You know, the first mm -hmm. one has already done something to your palate, conditioned it for some way sure. or another. Yeah. There's a tasting order, which actually, if you go down to our server station, we have all the beers on tap and the order in which they should be served. So mm -hmm. if they're putting a flight together, you know, they, they tell people, okay, start with this and go to this, you know, mm -hmm. to try to make it a progressive experience. Because mm -hmm. someone drinks the double IPA <laughs> and then they drink the Pilsner and it goes, it doesn't taste like anything. And they drank the reverse. Yeah. They, you know, so there's, mm. there's so much of that that um, mm. people forget so, about or don't even know. So your taps are set up in that in that way? Not so much the taps, but let's say if you line up a flight. Yeah. So we have five beers in a flight. We tell them, okay, this is the least robust beer we have on the menu, and this is the most, and here's the progression in between. So if they line up a flight, they'll go from beer to beer. Now we can't control if somebody orders a pint of deep cut and then they order a pint of Pilsner. Right. It is what it is, you know. We, don't, we can't tell them, no, I, I'm not gonna serve you a Pilsner. You know? <laughs> You're doing this wrong. But uh, but there is a progression to how this should be done, you know, truthfully, and most people don't take that into account when they're really trying to, uh, you know, decide if they like a beer, you know. Mm -hmm. So like the thing about like, oh, it tastes sort of light, mm -hmm. like we'll get that a lot. Like we have a, we have a, we have a Schwartz beer we made called Fall Black. And people are like, oh, it tastes, it tastes like a light porter. There's something wrong with it. It's like, no, that's what it's supposed to be. Like, they don't even realize it. Mm -hmm. you know? So it's, it's very it's sort of subjective. And your tastes also changed, because at the time I wasn't really into sessions, and then I had a few others. I mean, All Day from Founders comes to mind, and uh, a few others. And then I came. that's when I came back and had the 
well, it was just this past week, or this past week, teacher, I'm out for the summer. Um, awesome. And um, I tried the, the FC again, and I just, I don't know what I was thinking at the time, but it's, it's great, it's a great beer. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, it's, it could be the recipe, it could be you, it could be anything else, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, so right. I'm glad you tried it again. Yeah. I'm glad I, you liked it. I'll always give anything in Buffalo a second chance. Good. Even living here. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Will you guys tweak beers based on, um, so not, not only trying to hit, you know, what that, that idea that you had to begin with and then tweaking to get to there, but based on uh, trends, whether they're local, national, uh, like over the past few years as the juicier New England style IPA has become popular, tweak aiming towards that? Or would you just create a new beer for that and then tweak for a beer towards whatever it was originally supposed to be? Or how, how does that play in? So, uh, that's a really good question. Um, <clears throat> So again, best to start out with hay burner. So like when we when we started doing hay burner in the beginning, so like I, we we knew that we wanted hay burner to be like not too sweet and not too bitter, have lots of hop flavor and aroma. You know, um, even the amount of bitterness acceptable in an IPA has decreased over time, right? Um, the other thing is the way they look has changed. <laughs> so in the beginning, we have uh, like we were adding, we never filtered it, but we were like adding fining agents to get it to look a little clearer. You know, a beer that looks the way these beers look now was like a flaw. <laughs> right, sure. Even, you know, not even four years ago, three years ago. Um, so we ex put a lot of effort and dumped a lot of beer down the drain to try to get those beers to look a certain way. Exactly. And after a while, I kept seeing people saying like, hey, this beer's freaking awesome. And it looked like the way beers look today okay very 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 easy <laughs> opaque right mm -hmm. and then i'm like why are we spending all this money and time to try to get these things to look a certain way why don't we just stop doing that and let's see what happens yeah, just leave it be yeah and so we spent a lot of effort uh, we well, we, not, we, we, well actually we removed a lot of efforts in trying to do that and we just like removed the finding agents and sort of saw how it went and we're like we think this actually tastes pretty good too and it's actually more stable than the other way so we made that change you know and um, and even still, we'll get complaints from accounts that take it and buy it on draft. It's like, oh, I think there's something wrong with this keg. It's like, well, no, this is the way they look now, you know? <laughs> and like, smell it. Does it smell good? Taste it. Does it taste good? And that's all that really matters, yeah, you know? Right. And there's also a lot of emphasis put these days on how beer looks, you know? Yeah. And it's it's still like less important. You know, the way it looks mm -hmm. is sort of a consequence of trying, should be a consequence of trying to make it smell and taste as good as possible right so, it's uh, yeah. especially with the new england style i mean it's the it's what will happen to the beer based off of what you're putting into correct. the beer to create that style correct and so it's got it went from being like a flaw to have it look very very hazy to now you know if you call a beer new england style and it's not like super hazy and you know, chunky looking or whatever it is, then people think that's a flaw. Mm -hmm, yeah. You know, so <laughs> it's too clear. <laughs> we, 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 we very rarely use, we, we don't really use this term New England IPA um, sort of for that reason, because if you let, you know, most of those beers, you let them sit around long enough, they're going to settle out anyway. Right. You mm -hmm. know, so, um, true. you know, I, I, I wish there wasn't so much emphasis on, um, Appearance, you know, it's really about how it smells and tastes. Yeah. Then, uh, if you can give us a little, like, where can where can people find your beer? Where you know, um, just different places they can find it. And... Your advertisement. Yeah. Sure. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, we sell our beer in um, pretty much all of Western New York, so the Buffalo area market, Rochester area market, and a lot of the counties in between. Um, you can find it on drafts at local bars and restaurants all over both of those areas and you know all like pretty much majority of supermarkets um, as well as retailers you know and, and uh, cans and in drafts uh, and then also our tap room is downtown Buffalo so come by and see us you know usually have you know, 10 to 12 beers on tap we've got a lot of good food that goes well with the beer we've got usually a couple of nice little cans you can take with you as well too so mm -hmm. hopefully folks uh, there's games upstairs there's games, mm -hmm. yes. Shuffleboard, darts, yeah, TVs for other games that are on TV. It's, it's a great place yeah, to have beer. Yeah, that's that's great. Thank you, mm -hmm. and thanks you guys. Yeah, yeah. Thanks thank for you coming for on. on the show. Yeah, yeah sure. thank you. Thanks, it's awesome. All right, well, thank you for joining us, everyone. Um, again, we are here at Big Ditch talking to Matt. 
Uh, Matt, special thank you for you for taking time out of uh, the busy can release day to talk to us about Big Dish and the beers. Great, glad I could do it. All right, cheers, everyone. Cheers. cheers.